contact him one time. You know what I did? I, I then went and I said to uh, James Earl Ray, had he indeed fired the fatal shot on that April day? Obvious answer? I don't know. Let's listen. Do you feel the government had a conspiracy against you or your family to show you as the assassin of Martin Luther King? Well, th there is several things uh, highly unusual about the case. Did you do it? No. Well, I if don't... you had done it, would you say you did? Well, I doubt it very much. Uh, usually when you go to trial, uh, you don't go to trial to plead guilty. Hosea, you were one of Martin Luther King's confidants, one of his closest friends. Do you think James Earl Ray, and I re realize you haven't seen much of this interview yet, but you've been much deeper into this than most people have going back to 1978 hearings, etc. Do you think James Earl Ray pulled the trigger and killed America's greatest hero? No. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Much of the flack surrounding the murder of Martin Luther King centered on Ray's supposed hatred of black people. Now, I asked him that question. Here's his answer. Do you ever refer to anyone as a nigger? I can't recall. Usually, people talk around cell blocks and things like that. Even blacks refer to themselves as niggers and things like that. But uh, it uh, depends on whether you're talking about someone in a hostile manner or just, uh, you know, just everyday conversation. As a kid growing up, Alton, Illinois, you were in an area where you were just across the border from St. Louis, yes. East St. Louis on the yes. other side, which a lot of people in those days looked upon as nothing more than the, uh, than the working whorehouse for St. Louis itself. East St. Louis, yes. Sir. Black ghettos in those areas. There may be now. There wasn't too many. The fact is, Alton, Illinois, I don't think there's about a thousand blacks in the whole town. I've very seldom you know, seen a black. So, uh, St. Louis, I believe, that's a little different. But there's mostly, uh, you have segregated neighborhoods, so you don't see too much of them. Uh, you, racers. Do you like or dislike blacks 20 years ago, and how do you feel about them today? No, I don't have too much opinion of them. They're just here and I'm here. I don't think they're all saints or... How do you get along with the blacks you know, in prison? Uh, I've never had any problems with them except uh, once, and sometimes uh, tension creates around here. And, uh, I know one time, uh, the only incident I had, I got stabbed during 1981, but that was uh, uh, nothing that... Uh, you know, Were you stabbed by a black man? Yes. All right, let me, let me go to you, Mark Lane. You're one of the best investigative lawyers in the country. Certainly your reputation is sometimes among some people that you'd uh, find a conspiracy in a three people meeting at a Wendy's. But uh, did you ever detect hatred of black people in James Earl Ray? No, I didn't. I, I do remember that uh, on occasion he had problems in that Brushy Mountain Penitentiary. And on occasion when someone tried to do something to him, and I met black prisoners there, they told me they would stand in front of him and protect him. Why? Because they thought he was innocent. And uh, I have never found a black leader in this country who did not believe that James O. Ray was innocent, or at least did not believe there was a conspiracy to kill Dr. King. I mean, I became James's attorney. I was asked to do that by leaders of the black community, by Ralph Abernathy. I talked to Coretta King about it. Reverend James Lawson, who was the teacher of the schools of nonviolence for Dr. King in Memphis. Uh, I brought him in to see James R. Ray, and he left and said, I'm convinced he's innocent. And later, when James R. Ray was going to become married in prison to an artist he met, he asked me to ask Reverend Lawson to marry him, this black minister. And I asked Reverend Lawson, and he said, well, you know, I have a black congregation. And he thought about it, and he said, well, I'm, I'm sure he's innocent. I can't think of a reason not to marry perform a ceremony for an innocent man and he went and he, he performed the wedding ceremony all right then next we're going to come back and we're going to find out what makes the mind of a murderer tick stay with us as we continue with james. the deeper the deeper i got into this story the more people i spoke to prison guards wardens, heads of security, black leaders, the more I suspected the entire story was not out, was not out in the minds of the public, and that something was being hidden. I asked James Earl Ray, for instance, about his family. 
and about his and his family's background. I'd like to hear what he said right now so our audience here and at home can find out too, please. Okay, my friends, you've been here since 19... When did you come to Brushy? Uh, 1970. 1970? Yes. Give me a little bit about your background. Uh, let, let me ask you first. Uh, were you ever in jail before? Yes, several times. So you're not, uh, you're not a lily white, uh, nice little choir boy, are you? No, as a matter of fact, I was only escaping when Martin Luther King's assassination took place. You were out in the state at that yes, time? Yes, in Jefferson yeah. Prison, I believe. Jefferson City Prison. Yes. Jefferson City Prison, Missouri. That's the one they call it, Big Jeff? Yes. All right. Now, give me a little bit of your background, where you were raised, how you were raised. Tell me about your father. Tell me about your brothers. Well, I was born in Alton, Illinois. That's uh, right across the river from St. Louis, Missouri, no, suburb of St. Louis, Missouri. Mm -hmm. uh, my father, he worked around that area for uh, most of my life, I suppose. What did he do for work? Well, he didn't do anything in particular. I think he was a truck driver and things of that nature. He's a, more or less a working class. Work class to... Was he working class or was he a criminal? He was in, in prison one time. One yes. Year. How many years was he in for? I believe he did a five-year sentence and he escaped. He didn't do the five years. Sounds like an armed robbery, huh? I really don't know what it was. Okay, it's taped. So you weren't really brought up by your daddy then? Yes, my father and my mother. Yes. You were brought up by him. Well, he, he escaped after, uh, he got married after he escaped. Oh, so then yes. uh, he was never caught again? No. no never put back no. in prison? Did that keep the family on the run because you had a father who might be caught again for escaping from prison? No, just one time it was ever what, what you call on the run. Uh, that, that happened uh, my uncle, he got arrested with and uh, my dad's brother, and uh, he uh, put some heat on the family, so to speak, so we left Alton, Illinois at one time. How many other members of your family? Brothers, sisters? Yeah, six, yes. Six? Yeah. All brothers? No, two sisters. Two sisters? Yes. Three other brothers? Yes. All your brothers uh, managed to stay out of prison? No, they've all been in prison. Uh, one brother's a fugitive now. Uh, but uh, the one, the other brother, uh, Jerry, he's not. Uh, he was in prison about 30 years ago. He hasn't been uh, in prison since. And my other brother, John, he was. Uh, he was accused of various bank robberies after I was charged with Martin Luther King uh, assassination. And uh, ultimately, I think he was sentenced to 18 years for a bank robbery by federal, federal judge. Yeah. Uh, accused of other bank robberies. Federal Judge Webster later became the director of the FBI. What we're seeing here, frankly, is uh, the anatomy of a family. Family born into a working poverty class. We're seeing a family where you're seeing every member of that family in prison at one time or another. You're seeing a father, remember this, a father who escaped, then got married, then had his kids. Never caught, never recaptured, and almost served a sentence. And further on in this interview, you're going to see how that information was used against James Earl Ray. Now, this is the perfect victim for a conspiracy. So I went out, and I went a little bit further, and I decided to check up on his brother, Jerry. I found his brother, Jerry, and here's what he told us. Roll that tape. I guess the last time was Dan Rather. Do you believe that your brother killed Martin Luther King? No, I always have claimed they didn't do it, and uh, uh, most of the uh, black leaders even claim he didn't do it, Jose uh, Williams and Jesse Jackson. You, if someone offered him $100,000 to kill Martin Luther King, would he have then done it? I, I, I couldn't say one way, way or the other if he would have or not. Somebody offered that much. I don't think so because he's not violent. He's never had to use violence before. But, uh, if it was offered to you, would you have done it? No, I, I, w I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't kill nobody. I wouldn't give it to care if they give me a million dollars. Do you have any information on the assassination? Do I have any information? Mm -hmm. Well, I've done a lot of checking out for James, and whatever I checked out, I turned it all over to him. And uh, and plus, he's, he's identified pictures before of people that was involved that he met, you know. See, he, he never did deny that he wasn't involved in the assassination. He was unknowingly involved in it. He was at Memphis at the time King was killed, and uh, he was in that roaming house up there. But... He wasn't the one that fired the shot, and the only eyewitnesses 
uh, woman uh, identified the person that actually pulled the trigger. The woman who spent 10 years in the mental institute. Yeah, and what they did, after she identified the person that actually done it, I mean, she uh, didn't pick out of, you know, she described the person that done it. The day he was arrested in London, England, they took her and changed her name and put her in a Bolivar State Mental Institution. And she didn't get out for over 10 years later when Mark Lane got her out. The plot thickens. Mark Lane. One of the names that keeps cropping up throughout the entire Martin Luther King affair is that of the mysterious Raoul, all right? Now, this is a name that the FBI and other government agencies have let us believe is a figment of James Earl Ray's imagination. Is this guy real or just a two-bit con's imagination? James has been very consistent in describing that person. And the description he's given, Jerry Ray was quite correct in everything he said about Grace Wald and Stevens, as a matter of fact. And she is the only witness in the world who was in that rooming house, right next to the bathroom, heard the shot, and saw the killer come out. And she saw that man. The description she gives of that man is exactly the description of Raoul, which James O. Ray was giving at a different time. It is clearly not the description of James O. Ray. The man oh, was... This woman is then put in a mental institution. Well, she, no, first she's questioned by the FBI. Mm -hmm. Don't you want to do something for your country? Come on down. The whole country wants to catch Ray. He's now in London, and we need an affidavit from you because there's an extradition treaty between the United States and England, and you must have probable cause. They could have brought him back for the escape, that's true, but then because of that treaty, they could only have tried him for the escape. They want to try him for the murder of Dr. King. Hosea, let me ask you. Can I just, the, uh, can I just finish this one thing? Yeah, exactly, second. Mark. She then describes the man again, and they show her a picture of James R. Ray. And she said, that's not the man. The man I saw was 10 years older, much shorter, much thinner. And they warned her that she'd better go along. She said, I can't. You have the wrong man. They picked her up a few days later, and they put her in a mental institution. She had never been in a mental institution in her life. She was in her 50s at that point. She was there for 10 years. When I heard about it, I went back to Memphis. I met with the Catholic leaders, the Jewish leaders, the Protestant leaders, and we made demands, and finally she was released to a halfway house, and I got her out of there, and she stayed with my family for years in Los Angeles. To this day, when last I talked to her, her position is it was not James O. Ray. I'm sorry they put me in that institution for 10 years, but I would not lie about something so sacred. Hosea, does that ring with truth to you? <clears throat> yeah, I'd never believe uh, Ray killed Dr. King. Number one, when his shot was fired, um, the, I heard on the police band summoning the police south, the car went north. And a black guy come running around the end of the building screaming. He went that away in a white Mustang and a red Alabama tag. Now, the, the, back in uh, 1968, there wasn't no other car looked like a Mustang. He has a white one. You, you can tell a Mustang as far away you can see it. The next day, supposedly, they found the car in Atlanta. All the FBI, all the state troopers, the sheriffs and police, and you mean to tell me the guy drove the car 700 miles? I don't even believe it was the same car. Another thing that I, they never could explain to me, I'm an ex-Army gunner, expert gunner. And if you will check the windage of that day, the velocity of that rifle, and the distance, that guy was a, a one-shot expert. Dr. King. Absolute sharpshooter, and James O'Ray had no experience no at all. No place in his history has James been trained to shoot guns. Dr. King had, the bullet hit him right here, under the, right in the nostril here. If he had not moved, that bullet would have hit him as far away, between the eyes. A guy was talking with Dr. J. King, and Dr. King said, okay, I'll get my top coat. And as he flinched, the shot was fired. Uh, and I never believed that James O'Ray killed Dr. King. Another thing, we went to see Ray a few days after the killing. They let us in to talk to him. I wanted to see what kind of political philosophy. Ray had no political philosophy. He's just a two-bit redneck out in the street, a hustler. And, and the thing, if, when we start checking into how Ray was able to break out of prison and how this guy met these fine women, well, what they wanted with Ray? I think they were, were uh, uh, FBI people. How Ray won all that money, he has a two-bit dice shooter winning all this money. When they caught Ray uh, after the, the death of Dr. King, he had four passports. He was no world traveler. And, 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 and the passports that were not really his were pictures of guys look just like Ray. Guys in, in, uh, in uh, Canada and so forth. I never believed, none of us ever believed, that James Earl Ray, but if Ray had not pleaded guilty, they would have convicted him and sent him to the electric chair.
We're going to find out why he pleaded guilty, how he pleaded guilty, what the what the intimidation was for him to plead guilty, what the pressure was on his family. Next, on the road to Memphis and the death of an American dream. Stay with us. Gentlemen, I want to, I want to take it, zip it, gang, zip it. I want to take just a minute now. I want to go to Barry Slotnick, who's working on this case with us, along with Mark Lane, Hosea Williams, who are with us as guests tonight. Barry, question for you: the gun, the Martin Luther King killing. There was supposedly never a ballistics report on that gun. You familiar with that? I know all about it. What are you going to do about it? We, we are going to ask for the gun, and we're going to do our own ballistics test. Is that, that possible after almost tw after 20 years to be able to come up with any answer? Absolutely, without a question. The bullet, unfortunately, the fatal bullet is still being preserved. The gun's been preserved. We have our ballistics experts that are ready. All we need is the gun. We're going to ask for it nicely. If they don't give it to us on behalf of the public and Mort Downey, we're going to sue them. We want that gun, and we want to check the ballistics against it. And we want the answer for the American people. <laughs> Barry, on behalf of our office, we thank you, and of all our audience around the country, we thank you. Black people, white people want the answer, all right? We know someone's guilty. We want to damn well find out who it is. James Earl Ray is not a, uh, a, a sitting swan, all right? But we don't want his neck cut off when there's someone up there bigger who's responsible for what happened. Now, most of the testimony that the government offered at the trial said that James Earl Ray tracked Dr. King through the South, eventually winding up in Memphis, Tennessee. Let's listen to James Earl Ray's version. James, how do you get over to Memphis? Why are you in Memphis? Well, at that time, he told me we was going to pick up some guns and some other things, and uh, I think two types of weapons, and uh, sell them some to some gun dealers in Mexico. He just gave me a general story about it. And uh, he asked me to go to a... Uh, he asked me to go to a, uh, a gun store, sporting goods store, and, and buy a rifle. With a tele telescopic sight, he, he explained generally what it was. And uh, he also asked me to check on foreign-made rifles. And so I went down to the sporting goods store and I purchased a rifle and I told him that uh, I was going to deer hunting or something. So the... The uh, salesman sold me the rifle, and uh, he also uh, indicated where these uh, foreign-made rifles was. But he tried to discourage me from buying them, so I, I guess he wanted me to you know, buy the expensive rifle. Anyway, I took those back to Raul. One, two, or three? Just one, yes. And he told me, no, he said, that's the wrong kind. He said, uh, he said uh, that's the wrong boy or something. And uh, I've got a brochure from the salesman. And I said, well, i got a brochure here. So what kind do you want? So... And he pointed out what kind he wanted. So I went back down and... Uh, that brochure ever found? Well, I don't know if it is or not, because the salesman they give them out there when I guess. So I, I went back down there and told him what I wanted. And I said, the type of purchase is the wrong type. Bring the other gun back? Yes. So he said, well, uh, I said, okay. But he said, it'll take me <clears throat> until tomorrow to get this one fixed. Uh, so I said, okay. So I went back and told Raul what happened on this. So he said, okay. He said, but he said, I got to go, so... He said, uh, said, I have to go to New Orleans. And uh, he said, uh, you can get the weapon and take it on to Memphis. And he gave me some details. I think he wrote a note down on a piece of paper where I should uh, meet him. As, uh, where were we supposed to meet him? A motel in Memphis called New Rebel. New Rebel? Yes. So uh, anyway, the next, uh, he left. I think I dropped him off. Or, I'm, I think I dropped him off at the post office. I'm not certain. I might have dropped him off the train station. But anyway, he, he left. And the next day, I went and picked up the weapon. It was ready. And he gave me enough money to purchase. I think he gave me $700 and, uh, for travel expenses and purchase the weapon. So uh, from there on, I started to drive towards Memphis. I think this was uh, March of 29th. Now, there's some conflict in this. The, the committee, the government claims that I went back to Atlanta and stayed there until uh, uh, March 3rd. And I heard Martin Luther King's going to be in Memphis. And I drove to Memphis, but I didn't. I, I, uh, they presented a map, or there was a map that was discussed at that time, supposedly that yes. was found in your possession or in, in, in your 
in your property that indicated areas where Martin Luther King had been? They claim they found that map in the rooming house I was staying in Atlanta. And uh, I read several books. Did you books. stay in a rooming house in Atlanta? Yes, yes. Uh, I stayed there and I met Raul there one time. We, 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 me and him rented a room together. Well, did you know anything about that map? There was a map there. I, I used to mark on maps every time I go to the city. I'd mark, you know, get my bearings. But I think the government contend, well, anyway, their book brothers contend that I marked Martin Luther King's church, his residence, and his office, and something else. But actually, what that should have been seen in the trials. Yeah, well, it, it should have been the newspaper and everything else as such a map. But the only map that I had, I marked the street I came in on. But the FBI did announce that that map was found. Did announce, and it was announced at least through the media that map had uh, Martin Luther's church, his home, and other areas on it, and yet it has never been seen. I would think that map would have been the cover of Time magazine. Oh, yeah. It, well, the Congressional Committee, they, they would present it. You know, they'd had it on television and everything else, but there's no map. That's just something they put out to the news media. And then, uh, you know, a book writer, he'll write it, and the next one, he'll come along. He'll say, say it enough times, it becomes the truth. Now, when you stop to think about this, a map spelled out all the places where Martin Luther King had been, a map that the FBI talked about being prime evidence in this case. A map that's never been seen. No one's ever seen the map. Now, now we're at the first of several very critical points. The gun. The actual weapon that was supposedly used. Let's find out about that. Now, in your trial, in your trial, one of the government's main witnesses, yes. I should say, one of the government's main detractors of James Earl Ray, was a man who was allegedly on the floor in the boarding house where you stayed across from Martin Luther King's motel, who signed a statement saying that he saw a man who met your identification yes. racing from a common bathroom Yes. That faced out. But he tried to get in that bathroom at 6 o'clock. It was locked. Heard the noise outside, the commotion, looked outside, saw what was going on, came back into the hall, and as he looked, you ran, or someone who looked like you, ran down the stairs holding this weapon. <coughs> Did your attorney ever perform ballistics on that weapon after it was recovered by the government? No, they wouldn't. Uh, they wouldn't permit that. Uh, they the they perform ballistics. Well, they claim the the uh, weapon couldn't. Uh, you couldn't. It was a certain type of a slug used to shoot Martin Luther King, and the slug they claim was some type of sophisticated slug that they couldn't uh, run ballistics on it. Couldn't do a ballistic. No. So indeed, there were no ballistics performed on the weapon. No. No tests performed that showed that weapon was the weapon that was fired. They claim they don't know. They just assume it was. And... Mark Lane, let me ask you a question. Why in the hell wasn't that weapon tested? I mean, you wouldn't let a client of yours plead guilty and go to jail unless you were sure that they had provided you with a definite murder weapon. Right. right. Let's make it plain. I was not James R. Ray's attorney at that time. That was Percy Foreman. Percy Foreman was in on the deal to prevent James Earl Ray from ever getting a trial and to hide the facts. I'd like to tell a very brief story now, if Isn't I can. Isn't it true that at that time, some of the law enforcement agencies in this country had some good uh, information on Percy Foreman about warehouses that he had with goods in those warehouses, and indeed this could have been evidence used to pressure Percy Foreman into being a, a pawn of certain elements of the I government? Think, I think you're quite right, and I think that's what happened. Remember, he was represented, James O. Ray was represented by Arthur Haynes Sr., and Arthur Haynes Jr. was about to go to trial in a day or two, and all of a sudden, Percy Foreman goes into that jail. He has not filed a notice of appearance. He's not the attorney. He's not allowed in there. There's no way to get in there. Ray did not ask to see him, and he, the sheriff's department but he was allowed in. brings him right in, and that's when the deal was set up. I'd like to, if I can, tell you something that no one has ever heard publicly before. When the House Select Committee on Assassinations, Mr. Ray talked about the committee. That was the House Select Committee on Assassinations. I know about that committee. I wrote the legislation which formed it, and I worked all around this country to get that passed in the Congress. They were investigating the murders of Dr. King and of President Kennedy. When they were formed, Walter Fauntroy, 
of Washington, D.C., was made the chairman of the subcommittee on the King assassination. All right, he was the representative from D.C., yeah. uh, a seated member of the House of Representatives, right. a non-voting member. Right. Dick Gregory called me. Dick's an old friend. He called me one evening and said, I'm coming to town. Have Walter at your house. I want to talk to him. I called Walter Fauntroy. I live on Capitol Hill, right across the street from the Supreme Court. And they both came into my library. And... Uh, Walter Fauntroy had just begun his investigation, looked at a lot of material, <clears throat> and Gregory said, Walter, let's pray. And they kneeled down, I was behind my desk, they kneeled down on the little oriental rug and they held hands, and Gregory led the prayer, although Walter's minister. And Gregory said, oh Lord, give this man the power to get the facts and the courage to tell the truth about our beloved Martin Luther King. At that point, Walter looked up and said, I know the truth. This is the chairman of the committee. I know the truth, Greg. The FBI killed Dr. King, but I can't say it. The FBI is bugging my church, my home, my congressional office. And Greg said to Walter Frontroy, listen, Walter, what do we love about Martha, Martin? What do we love about him most of all? When he took a private position and he believed it, he did it publicly. And Walter looked at Greg for a moment and said, yes, but they killed him and I don't want to be killed. And Greg looked at me like... We worked so hard for this investigation. Jose, I don't what think about Walter Fauntroy? Well, let, let me tell you why I believe this. When the Congressional Committee was going around the country supposedly investigating the death of King, they came to Atlanta. When they interrogated me, I began saying to them, you are not even asking the right questions. And I start uh, uh, bringing up certain questions and giving them answers. Immediately they wanted to, to recess and they offered to take me the dinner and said we would resume the interrogation when we finished dinner. We went to dinner, came back, they claimed they got an emergency call and left. But they said it was going to come back and finish interrogating me. When they didn't, I registered an official complaint. And Walter said, no, we're not going to finish the... And, and he said this to me. We are afraid of what we are about to find out. Was James Earl Ray framed? Stay with us. Watch what happens. No one's painting this. No one's painting this guy as a choir boy. And nobody's saying that the new FBI is the same type of FBI that was working under J. Edgar Hoover. What we are saying is, aren't you starting to become mighty suspicious about this case yourself? Now, at the trial of James Earl Ray, there was one witness. His testimony placed him at the scene of the crime. Let's hear about that witness. Come on. You're talking about Charles. Q. Stevens. That's right. Now, we, we had a cab driver. We found a cab driver in 19... Well, the fact that they found him in 1969, the attorneys didn't tell me because they didn't want me to know it. Percy Foreman. Anyway, the cab driver testified that he uh, came to pick up Stevens about two, three minutes before the Martin Luther King was shot. And Stevens was too drunk to get out of bed. Now, in reference to this, the statement Stevens made... Did the cab driver say that? Court. He testified in federal court in 1974. He also gave my attorney a statement in 1969, first foreman. The foreman withheld the evidence from me because he didn't want he didn't want me to know this. He wanted to make the, me think that somebody identified me up there. But anyway, uh, this Charles Stevenson, his was a common law wife was living there with him, and she testified he didn't see anything anyway. And she was put in a mental institution. She was held in a mental institution for 10 years. And, uh, so there's no credibility in that. Uh, for a Stephen statement, uh, a Justice Department lawyer named Flannery wrote that up for him, and it was uh, validated in federal court in Memphis. After you got uh, Charles's wife out of prison, I mean, out of the mental institution, ten years later, what effect did that have on her testimony? Said the same thing. She's consistent. Let me tell you about Charlie Q. Stevens because James is right exactly on score. The taxi driver's name is Jim McCaw. I interviewed him. He told me exactly what James said. I put it in my book that I wrote with Dick Gregory about this, as a matter of fact. Quoted him exactly, and that is that I received a call to take Charlie Q. Stevens down to a bar. And I got there, and he was passed out, drunk in the bed. I left. The shot was fired about two to three minutes later. Interestingly enough, I told that Jack Anderson did a TV show on this question. 
And he had a uh, fine uh, polygraph operator, one of the best, Chris Gugas, used to do it for the CIA for years. And I said to him, well, listen, get James McCaw. He's the taxi driver. That's the whole case. And they, they tested him. Gugas said, without question, McCaw was telling the truth. Stevens was passed out drunk. And Anderson then said, I'm not going to put that on the air. And it's never been used. But that's what the slide detector expert discovered. All right, Hosea, uh, you've served 10 years in the Georgia legislature. You're now a uh, city councilman from Atlanta, Georgia. Who do you think did the killing? Well, there was no question uh, in our organization that uh, Dr. King and all the rest of us knew his days were numbered. You see, uh, King was the first American able to challenge the late J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI, and survive. And I feel to say that King would not have survived as long as he did had not the Kennedy brothers called J. Edgar Hoover off. But the real reason Dr. King was killed, and this always bugged me because the folk that were involved was at the funeral. Not James, the people who were really involved. When Dr. King, and Dr. King knew it, he called us in and he used to tell us, like, this is it. It's now or never, it's do or die. He was talking about the poor people's campaign. And he said, we're going to organize the poor of the nation. We're going, I remember him saying these words, going to California and get the poor Spanish speaking American, going to Carolina and get the poor Indians, going north and get the poor Puerto Ricans, and going to the Appalachian and get the poor whites with the poor blacks. And we are going to Washington to the seat of power. And we're going to demand a reshuffling of America's economic debt. That's when they said they had to kill King. Because they knew they had a better ways of monitoring our effect than we did. Had Martin Luther King Jr. going to Washington, the Poor People Campaign, he would have had at least a million people with him. And, buddy, they would have had to reshuffle the economic deck of this country. James Earl Ray has some theories as to who did the killing. James? Why would Raul want to kill Martin Luther King. Was he a paid assassin? Well, I suppose he had a, a sponsor. Uh, in in the book, uh, I never mentioned uh, who was who did uh, who was what group was behind it. Uh, well, you're not in the book now. Now you got yeah, now you got but millions it's really, of Americans. Well, it's to say he was, uh, he, but you must have an idea. You never you never know. You just take these names and you just have to let individuals make up their own mind. But you so, must have an idea. Really. But I don't like. The Expressing the ideas because it's so much classified, so many records classified. But Maybe this could force some yeah. of those records yeah. to be unclassified. Yeah. Maybe we can get someone yeah. uh, like uh, Lewis Stokes, who sat on that committee, who's still in Congress today, who was a very respectable, responsible man, yeah. albeit his politics are different than mine, yeah. to come out and try to get you a fair hearing because I think the American people want to know who killed Martin Luther King. And they don't want a James Earl Ray sitting in prison for the rest of his life in Brushy, no matter how beautiful this country is here. They don't want you sitting here. They don't want you on their conscience and Martin Luther King on, on their conscience. Who do you think was involved in the killing? Do you think Raul was? Well, I think he was. I think he was uh, probably just a, he's a hard hand like me, more, more or less. Uh, I have, uh, I think there's a fellow named David driver getting out. Of course, he's a, he's a bag man, too, but he's a, at that time, he was a, more or less a hard help. But uh, it, it appears to me if the government doesn't have any involve, involvement in whatsoever, they'd go ahead and, and release these classified records that clear, you know, that clear the government, the FBI and the CIA and these, these agencies. But uh, uh, since they won't, uh, they must be hiding something because they're not, they're not classifying and hiding these records. A new name surfaces, get not. We haven't heard that name before, we haven't read it in books, we haven't seen it in stories, but it surfaces, a new name. Now, did the government use coercion to get a confession out of James Earl Ray because he did confess? James has that story. Listen. So you are telling us there was coercion used on you to plead guilty. Oh yeah, well... Coercion on you because your father could be put in jail yeah, yeah. for a 30-year previous yeah. escape, yeah. because your brother could be put back yeah. into jail, because you were a guy who never had... You didn't walk around with 10,000 bucks in your pocket any time. No, I never had any of that type of... Uh, what would happen if you got out of jail now? What would you do? There's a lot more to go here now. There's a lot more to go here now. We've heard the name Gitnacht come up. 
And uh, Hosea, you mentioned something also about pressure on the family, the Martin Luther King family. Would you repeat that? Well, that, there's no question about when Ray says that he was pressured and they used uh, uh, things they would do to his family to get him to go along uh, to plead guilty. I do know this, that there was great pressure and blackmail on the King family because we, the executive staff, wanted a trial, wanted to bring everything in open. But J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI came up with a whole lot of junk about King's sex life and about uh, some child was involved and if they went to court, they'd go prove that some black dentist wanted to kill a whole lot. So rather than go through all this misery, they convinced the King family. But the FBI pressured the King family. I understand that the King family isn't too happy that they made that no, deal not too now, happy. all right? No, not I asked James Earl Ray to name names. <laughs> and finally, after some prodding, he did. Let's see that. The conspiracy, a name you just mentioned. Well, well I mentioned David Grover Gettinott. Uh, he's, uh, I, I saw him, I'm almost positive, in the New World Laredo with Raul when I was down there in uh, October 1967. Uh, we, we did a little background check on him. He was uh, involved in some type of a... Uh, David Grover Gettinott. Gettinott, G-I-T-N-A-C-H-T, yeah. Is that his real name? Yes. That, well, that's his... Uh, he went under German alias. word uh, mean night, did not, uh, of night. Well, he, he's from South Argentina. He was involved in the terrorism down there one time. He's also uh, had some associations with the Rockefellers. And I figure maybe that's why they tried to... know he had associations with the Rockefellers. Well, we found out through reading articles about him. He, he... So you're believing the press that you don't want other people to believe? Pardon? Pardon? You're believing the media. You said you read yeah, articles. Yeah, well, I, I just... I'm checking on his background now, yeah. see. This, this is his background, but... Uh, I don't think the Rockefellers involved in this, but I think it might be embarrassing to them. And, uh, of course, this brings me to Tennessee. Uh, I think uh, I have uh, strong suspicions that uh, possibly Martin Luther King wasn't killed in Tennessee by accident. Now people are looking into the background of Mr. Gitnock. He's dead. We've got Mark Lane looking, Barry Slotnick looking. Our people are looking. We'll find something because we're going to do another show about did the FBI do the killing. We'll be right back. Sir. I'm more. My name is George Chizak. Uh, we've gone through four administrations. All these questions have been around for the last 20 years about Martin Luther King and President Kennedy. Kennedy. Why have these presidents not done anything about it? Why have, them, why have they left them totally in doubt? I think if, if you're asking me to answer, I think the only answer I can give you is that once you start a conspiracy, once you commit a crime, you do everything in your power, the next person, the next person, to cover it for fear the American people would just bring down the administrations. I think that's probably what's happened. But if an administration has to come down because they're going to be dishonest with the American people, so be it. The hell with that administration. If the FBI has to be held to account because of mistakes that they made, so be it. Those who made the mistakes should be held to account. Not, of course, the FBI, because it's a very valid institution in this country. Tonight, you heard the story of James Earl Ray. Part of it. Did he murder Martin Luther King, or didn't he? One thing I know for sure, there are hundreds of thousands of classified documents that need to be seen by the American people. Documents that conceal James Earl Ray's fate or declare him innocent. I call for the declassification of those documents. I call for our people to get a ballistics report on that gun. I call for an immediate trial of James Earl Ray and any of those who conspired to cover up the murder of Martin Luther King and keep that information from the American people who have the right to know. Yeah. Ask. Yeah. And you shall receive.
six that Larry Davis and seven police officers met in an apartment in the Bronx. A gun battle ensued that left six police officers, some of them seriously injured with bullet wounds. Larry Davis escaped unharmed. After one of the biggest manhunts in New York City history, he was apprehended and stood... Begins a series of special reports. It's a working class movement that's politically aware. I enjoy the style, I enjoy the music. It's something that I, I fit into. A very rainy Sunday in New York, and we have come to CBGB's here in the Lower East Side because the skinhead movement is built essentially around a special kind of rock and roll music, a kind of rock and roll music that is performed here. And we come on Sunday because Sunday for skinheads is thrash day. The skinheads are drawn to the angry power of punk rock music and display their appreciation of it by thrashing about on the stage and dance floor. The music articulates a rage that all skinheads seem to share, but few seem able to put into words. The shaved heads, the polished steel tip work boots, the skinhead style, all provide a refuge and a vague code of conduct for a small segment of our alienated young. We believe in using our fists. And, um, and our feet and our boots, our bodies. We don't believe in going around with guns and everything. Because that's, that's not for, that's not really the skinhead way, you know? Pete is one of them. This 21-year-old Long Islander was worried about losing his job when I met him. He doesn't expect to be treated fairly. Most skinheads don't. And it is worth noting that skinheads collectively view themselves as victims of society. A popular symbol, in fact, shows a skinhead on a crucifix. You see it on T-shirts, on car bumpers on tattoos. A lot of the public just crucifies me because of the way I look, because of my tattoos. They crucify me. Some skinheads, mostly in places outside New York, have become neo-Nazis and white power advocates. This variation on the skinhead theme has taken root as close as Trenton and Philadelphia. These skinheads have found a focus for their anger, a scapegoat, and a new type of racist rock music that glorifies hate. The English group Screwdriver is a favorite. American people really want blacks here. If they could, if they could get them out, would they really want them here? They don't have like, you know, in my opinion, rights anyway. So uh, I don't object to four people beating up a gang. It was here in New York recently. I sat with three skinheads who object to the racists and the Nazis. One of them, you will note, is black. He is also a little angry about all this white power talk. If we don't stand against them, because it seems nobody else is doing anything about it. We'll die for it. That's the way we feel about it. You know, this skinhead agrees and says you can usually tell racist and Nazi skinheads by the swastikas on their bodies and clothing. A German cross, he insists, is a more benign symbol with no racist or anti-Semitic overtones. And if you see this tattoo or symbol, you are dealing with a special brand of skinhead, a straight edge. A skinhead Nancy Reagan might even learn to love. I don't do drugs. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I, you know, I don't mess around, I don't hang out in the streets, I don't bother people, I'm, I'm... And that's all part of being a skinhead? To me, that is part of being a skinhead, yes. Tomorrow, however, we'll see some disturbing early warning signs of skinhead racism in our area. Lewis Young, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. Coming up next here, the coach of Columbia University's foot... ...committed in Manhattan. Did his sister let you into the house? Yes, she did. Okay, what happened when you came in? Well, when I went into the house, I was the first one in. I went into the um, bedroom, not the bedroom, the living room, and Davis was getting up off the couch. He got up, he had a sort of run across the living room, had a gun in his hand, and I yelled for him to stop to freeze. He continued on down and ran down the hallway to a rear bedroom. I yelled to the other officers that were there to watch it, he has a gun. As I started to go to the hallway, there were two children, young babies, two years old. I think one was maybe six months old. These are his nieces and nephews. I, I don't know who they I'm were. Told. I understand they are, but uh, I believe that they may have been in diapers. They were in the hallway. I stopped. I, again, I yelled, everyone, everyone, watch it. He has a gun. At that point, I thought that we had him trapped in the rear bedroom. The back windows were uh, covered by other police officers outside. And I thought that uh, we were going to capture him, take him in, and uh, there wasn't going to be any problem. He then opened fire on us. From where? From the rear bedroom. 
He opened fire and hit police officer Mary Buckley. Hit her where? Hit up in the mouth area. Uh, at that point, I went across to try to assist police officer Buckley. And as I was going across, I was shot. I was shot <clears throat> in the mouth with a bullet went in through my mouth, broke my jaw, hit an artery. Was this from a 45 caliber? I believe it was. Um, and came out the rear after severing an artery. I still have fragments in my uh, left side from the bullet. How did you get out of the apartment? Well, I got out to the front of the building. The apartment was on the ground floor. I got out, I walked out. Uh, and Bleeding severely? Excuse me, yes. And uh, when I got outside, there was a lieutenant, Lieutenant Sebring, who uh, carried me across the street to the hospital. The hospital was directly across the street uh, from the building. Larry Davis told me during the interview yesterday that he never shot to kill, that he shot at the feet of police officers to just drive them back. Well, I'm shot in the mouth, and uh, maybe he's not a good shot then. Okay. There were other officers... Seven officers, I believe, in the apartment? Seven officers in the apartment, and all of those officers, I was thinking that um, probably they have, between us all, we have over 125 years with New York City Police Department. And all of them, most of them have been in a, a, a high-risk assignment in a high-crime area. And between the 20, 125 years that we've been on the police department, not one of us have ever shot a person. Larry Davis says that he had known you since he was 14 years old and that he was involved in selling drugs for you in a corrupt scheme uh, with the police department, with other officers as well. How long had you known Larry Davis on this night? Well, I shouldn't dignify him by responding to anything he has to say. But I will continue, I will, because I will, we have to straighten out a few things. I had never seen him until the night that I walked into that living room. That's the only time I ever saw him uh, the first time I heard about Larry Davis was at the beginning of November of 1986. Never had any dealings with him, never saw him. What was your reaction when the verdict came through a week ago Sunday? Oh, I was shocked. I was shocked. I, I, I couldn't, couldn't believe that um, they could come up with the verdict they came up with. You called it a racist verdict in some press accounts. Why? Because I thought it was. How so? Well, I thought that they came to a findings without any evidence in his behalf. Um, they didn't present the case. They, they, they made these statements. They, made the, they played it in the press. They played it on TV. And they made these statements. They didn't present anything during the case. I testified in this case for four days. And not once in that four days did they ever ask me, did I know, like, did his attorneys asked me, did I know Larry Davis? Did I have any dealings with Larry Davis? There was not one question ever asked of me about uh, this alleged corruption. If they have any evidence of any corruption, I'm willing to waive any legal rights I have and let them go to the district attorney, the special prosecutor, whoever they would like to go to, and I'll waive any rights I have, answer any questions, or go for any grand jury to get this out in the open. I asked also Larry Davis yesterday if he thought the racial makeup of the jury was important, and he said, no, he believed that he would have been acquitted if, if there was a white jury sitting there in the courtroom. Did it make a difference to you? Well, you, you called it a racist verdict. So I guess, yeah, I, I think that it was conscious or subconsciously. But I just can't, I, I can't find a reason for his acquittal. The evidence was there. The whole case was there. I've, I've been involved in many cases. This is a case that had more than 98% of the cases that are brought to trial and where verdicts are, people are found guilty in. And they weren't able to find him guilty. Detective Diaz, what, 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 is the, what effect does this verdict have on the police department? Well, I think this, this makes our job a little more difficult when, when a jury comes back and, and finds a person innocent of shooting at a police officer. I'm not, I'm not sure if people are aware that there is a, a law in this state, you cannot resist arrest whether you feel you are guilty or innocent. You're not justifiable as shooting at police officers. Also, I believe we, you mentioned the jury before. I, I don't think the jury took and realized that these same victims that Larry Davis had, had gunned down were minorities themselves. 
the people in the Bronx that he was terrorizing were minorities, just as the jury were themselves. Luther Corbett, who was a member of the jury, is quoted in the paper as saying that Larry Davis was a victim of circumstance. He said the police were the aggressors in entering the apartment improperly. He says, I felt very badly for those police officers being injured, but because of the dereliction of duty of some officers, they caused the others to be injured. Was there dereliction of duty in this particular uh, uh, attempted arrest? No, sir. That, uh, that night, the, uh, we, we gathered intelligence on the apartment. We met before we, we decided to go to the apartment. We formulated a plan. We, we believed we had everything covered. The reason we, we had to act quickly was because of, of the possibility of him leaving the apartment, which he constantly was on the move. As far as that statement, I don't, and I don't understand where he could come up with those facts. A week ago, we had William Kunstler and Lynn Stewart, who were Larry Davis's defense attorneys. And Lynn Stewart mentioned something about the political atmosphere of this country and of the city and the role of the police department. This is what she had to say. I'd like to get your reactions to this. We do believe that third world people, black and Hispanic people, have a different view of the police. That they can hear the nuances in a Larry Davis story. That they deal with this kind of confrontation on a daily basis on the streets of the Bronx. And that they could hear it. You are entitled to a jury of your peers. These were a jury of their peers. So rarely does a black person who acts in his own self-defense, get the opportunity to tell his story to his peers. He is always being judged by the majority instead of by his own. Okay. There's some people out here in the audience who agree with that statement, and I'll be talking to you in a, in a short while. But what is your perception working in a minority community? Do you feel like an occupation force out there? Detective Lugo? Actually, not at all. If anything, we're there to serve the public, uh, regardless of what uh, the make of the community is. Uh, you know, you, you can laugh at what I'm saying, but I'm telling you that this is how we feel. You know, you can't go into my mind. We, we serve the public. Uh, the fact that uh, we are in high crime areas, we, we work in the Bronx. Uh, Didn't you tell me as well, though, you are a member of a minority community? Uh, of course, Just... I'm Puerto Rican, yes. All right. You told me that your own father came to you and asked you if there was any truth to this Davis story. very true. You see, when... Uh, you Hold know, on people begin to believe it to the point that your own family, my, uh, my own father questioned me, how do... Andy, how do you know what uh, the other guys were doing? I know because we were working on that case. We had nothing... And right now, what we want really is for Mr. Kunstler to come forward to any investigative body, you know, we don't want this to go on challenge anymore. We want him to come to any investigative body, be it federal, state, local, special prosecutor, anyone, to investigate. We want locations, offices involved, times, transactions, and we want that investigated. We don't want him to make the allegations to the media, to the press, and then, uh, or in the trial, or in the courtroom, at trial time, and then just uh, disregard it. And, I, and not only do we challenge him, we know, we can answer for him that he never will make these allegations because it never occurred. Captain Ridge, how were you shot? I was shot in the forehead with um, shotgun pellets. I probably got a ricochet <clears throat> next to John O'Hara, who was shot a hundred times in the head with shotgun pellets and lost his sight in his left eye. Larry Davis but said that since he was shooting at the feet of the police officers, that the police officers must have shot each other. Well, you know, some people don't know their feet from their rear end. He doesn't oh, know his feet from his head. Would, would, would ballistic tests show where these... Did you have shotguns coming into the room? Into the room? Yes, we did have you shotguns. You did have shotguns, so there is, the, there is at least that possibility, or not? No, no possibility whatsoever. It was never brought up in a trial at all. There was no doubt about who shot. He admitted shooting the police. There is no possibility because he admitted the, it. the ammunition being used by the emergency service police officer who has shotgun was different than that of the, the ammunition in Larry Davis's shotgun. What, maybe a lot of people don't realize it, but that night there were 20 different officers present at the scene. Why were there so six many? six different units. Why were there so many officers there? Because that's the type of person we were dealing with. Unfortunately, we didn't have enough. 20, 20, 20 different officers from six different units in the police department. Some of us had never seen each other before in our lives. So if you're going to go in to kill somebody, you're going to bring a stranger with you? This is the second raid that was done 
to, to apprehend Larry Davis. The first raid, there were almost approximately 20 people, and he escaped. So we're talking about like almost 50 different police officers from 15 different units uh, within the police department, and every police officer and every unit was corrupt? We were all in there to kill Larry Davis? One of the... Absolutely, for one minute. Excuse me, I'm going to have to ask you not to shout things out from the audience, because you'll have your chance to speak in just a moment. And please, Kim, if you will, try to keep the audience down. Thank you. Let me just ask you one thing. One thing that amazes a lot of people is with all of the police power that is there and with all of the training that police officers have, how did he escape when there were so many people, there was so much force brought to bear in this arrest? How did he escape? Because well, we didn't use the force. Because we went in there, as I said before, there were two children in that apartment, right? Two years old and six months old. And if we wanted to, we could open up on Larry Davis. We did not want to put the lives of those children in danger. And we were the ones who held back our fire, right? Yeah. We went there. We went there to arrest Larry Davis. All right. What? And that's what? all we wanted to do. If we arrested Larry Davis that day, he would have been in handcuffs. He would have been taken to the precinct, and the, you people would never heard about him. And if it didn't have the notoriety that it had, he would have been found guilty. Let me just. I I, I want to ask you one more question. We've been hearing the Kunstler and Davis side of the case for quite a while. Most of the police officers, though, have not spoken out about Why this. didn't we hear Kunstler's side of the story and Davis' side of the story in the courtroom where you can go on the cross-examination, where you just can't come up and say but that, why didn't you McCarran, answer their... that McCarran did this or McCarran did that? Why didn't, why didn't, you didn't, answer we, why didn't he take the stand in the courtroom under the protection of his attorneys, the judge, the district attorney, and come out with these allegations that he has? Why didn't you answer the allegations, though, earlier? I, would, I didn't want to dignify anything that he would have to say. But do, do, you, do you understand that in some quarters, the perception is, is that there's a blue wall of silence? In a very in small the, quarter. Since, since this verdict has come in, I've received more phone calls, more uh, meeting people, and just saying every single person I have spoken to has said that we got a raw deal in this case and that they believe us. Okay, I'm going to take a break right now. When I come back, we'll hear from some of the vocal people in our audience. And we'll also take a look at what Larry Davis says happened on that night of November 19th, 1986. Stay with us. We'll be right back. <laughs> Yesterday, when I visited Larry Davis in prison at the Metropolitan Correctional Facility, he had a very different story to tell about what happened on November 19th, 1986, and what led up to the incidents of that night. These are some of the things that he had to say. Did you shoot them? I, I don't know who got shot by me. But you did shoot at some I shot, I shot at the floor, and I shot trying to get them up from off the kids and trying to get them you from shot wild? Huh? You Excuse shot me? wild and you just got lucky? Is that what happened? I don't think I got lucky. I think their partners got lucky by shooting them. Do you wish that you killed them? If I wanted to kill them, I would have killed them. Wow. I backed them off. I just didn't want, I didn't want to hurt them. The weapons I had, I, I, I had got them from the police officers with the drugs. So did you ever deal drugs for the cops yourself? Personally go out on the streets and sell drugs? Yeah, that's when I first started. I did that and I, I, didn't, I didn't go in the street and sell it. I made package deals with Colombians, big boy, the, big, the Italian boys. How much money queen. did you eventually pick up for oh, the cops? It was, it was ridiculous money. How much? Hundreds of thousands? No, thousands, thousands, hundreds, you know, like that, hundreds of thousands. That's a, that's a lot of money. What would you do with the money? Would you party? What do you think I'm going to do with it? We, we only live short here, you know. We only party. live a short visit. When I party, mainly I just hang out with a lot of women. And, uh... Hookers? <laughs> that's a, no, not no hookers. Well, what do you need $10,000 to hang out with a lot of women well, for? Well, I'm not saying you, I'd spend all the money at that same time. Right. I, you know, I, I, you, you buy things with it or you... You buy you women do. presents and take them out to dinner? Jewelry or something like that. Whatever. Take them out to dinner. So spend why? Some dinners. Boat well, rides. All right, it sounds like you had a pretty good life going for you to some degree, even though it was outside the law, right? Oh, man. True. You had the police protecting you. Why, then, do you change your mind and decide to stiff the cops? Why did I change my mind? Because I didn't want no more to do, do with it. <laughs> okay, he claims that he had a million dollars from a drug deal that he was 
working on with the police officers. The million dollars was on the table in the room and then it mysteriously disappeared. Any money found in that apartment? Not that I know of, no. There was no money found. I think you can clearly see from that interview that as you're asking him the questions, he's making up the answers. I... Richard, I'd like to comment on the fact that when uh, I was one of the officers who took him into custody and he spoke to me afterwards uh, willingly, we weren't questioning him, he wanted to talk and he was getting out. Uh, we wrote down some of the stuff that he talked about, but uh, among the things he said was $2 million. Apparently, when you lie, you forget. He, now he reduced it down to a million. Uh, he mentioned the weapons that we gave him uh, were a couple of Uzis, M16s, uh, 45. Uh, I gave him a rocket launcher. You know, this is documented, a rocket launcher. Uh, of course, this never comes out in, in testimony because he never took the stand. If he ever took the stand, I could testify to the things that he uttered after we took him into custody. Uh, among other things that he talked about was uh, being present when some of his friends fired at the police subsequently changing it to say that he was in Virginia. And he's making reference to his friends being in a white car firing at the police. Uh, then he says, well, I wasn't there. My friends went back to Manhattan, but I was in Virginia that night. So it gives you an idea of uh, how much, li how, how... Uh, the man you're describing is a pathological liar. Absolutely. I mean, I think that if, if uh, the whole truth, uh, and eventually the whole truth will be known, uh, you can only come to that conclusion. Okay, do we have that telephone call? Good morning, you're on People Are Talking. Oh, yes. Uh, before I hear any more about people talking about racist in this thing, let me just put in my word here. I'm white. I lived in East Village for the past 10 years, 9th Precinct. I see every day, I see police shaking hands with drug pushers. If I ask them the time of the day, they'll tell me off, they'll threaten me. They sexually harass my girlfriend constantly. Okay, when I've tried to report this corruption to the police department, to IAD, they, tell, they threaten me. I get harassed and intimidated constantly because of my complaints. Okay, I can even deliver a tape from four years ago. I was beat up by a couple of police officers on my block. I, I have a tape recording of his fellow officers explaining why they had to beat me up, okay? And by the way, I am crippled. And they beat up a cripple and left him laying on the street. Now, how do you explain that? Okay. I don't, think, that, I don't think the officers will hear, will say that every officer is a good cop. Absolutely not. We've seen that in the past. We've seen some That's corruption. Correct. What and you're saying one is one of the reasons why you may see it is more than other places is that the New York City P Police Department, when they get any allegations of corruption, probably investigate it as thoroughly as you would investigate a homicide. This guy says we don't, he, he complains. I, I think if you listen to him, you know, he, he's really not. You, 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 you go in and complain. You, no, you, 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 you go in and complain, and you see how thorough an investigation that, that they do. We, we had nothing to do with that. Our department, without a question, is one of the, our internal affairs department is one of the most thorough, most complete in the nation. Any, any allegations is completely okay. investigated. Police department opposes Hold on. Civilian review. Let me ask out here. Wait a second. Police officers put their lives on the line. To, they don't put their lives on the line for you? Our community. They... Where's where is your community? First, let me, I live in East Flatbush. First, let me say this. Twelve years ago, my brother was coming home one night with five children, the oldest one, seven years old. And the policeman stopped him, DeKalb Avenue, and fired shots into the car. Okay? They thought that he had did something wrong. And my brother screaming, I got children. And from that day on, I have my feelings about policemen. I've been watching them, these people. Most of these people, policemen, are coming to our community and sell drugs or allow drugs to, to take place in our community. The police officers That's right. sell drugs. That's right. Here. That's correct. How do you know that? Like, we we see them. Anybody black could see that. If you want the darkest skin, I'll take it in our neighborhood and you'll see it. But I'd have to. We have no respect for the policemen for what we see them do. But you say I have to darken my skin first? No, for them to see. No, well, if you're white and you're around there, they'll, they'll hide it a little bit. They don't care. They don't hide it around us. So black people have a different perception. Of course we do. We see because we see. They weren't, we able, see to, they weren't able to kill him like they were. Michael Stewart, Eleanor Bumpers, Randolph All right, let's Evans, stick with Larry Davis for a minute. And on and on and on. Well, wait a second. You, whatever let's they stick, say. They excuse me, ma'am. Can I ask you for a moment? Let's stick with Larry yeah, Davis. Is Larry Davis a good guy? Is he a hero? He's a hero. Well, of course. What? He's a hero? Very sad to say that. Wait a second. Wait a second. Very sad to hear you say that. He's a hero. What makes him a hero? Defense in the face of superior arms. Sad, now let's put the lie to what these gentlemen like that, They sir. went to capture him. They knew every window was covered. They knew every door was covered, but did they lock the door and wait for him to come out? 
No. McCarran saved Mr. Davis's life. Monday morning. Monday morning. Because when he shot that gear yes. plug, I was there, Richard. All right. I was in the Here's an officer who was actually there. Hold on, sir. You had your part chance. Of the consular defense team. What they just gave over there was part of Lynn Stewart's summation on Michael Stewart and everything. They go into the rhetoric. Nobody even been on the police. I'm going to have to ask you to be quiet or leave. Answer this guy. Answer this guy. Yeah, I am. I gave you a chance to speak. Now I'm giving somebody a chance. Sir, I gave you a short time, and I'm going to give him a short time. Because there was a question answered. I, what was your question? I asked why they didn't lock the door when they knew he's given you the answer. Now be quiet. He didn't give the answer. I can't give an answer. This man was in court every day with well, wait a second. Stewart. Yeah. All he right. Don't tell questions. me who he is. Okay. Ask me why you said he was a Monday okay. morning quarterback. Monday morning quarterback. I was there. We're taking a lot of heat even within the police department. How could this man get away? Where does it say that we have to win? And you weren't in that hallway. That hallway was no more than three feet wide. You could have put 700 cops. When those bullets started coming, their assholes shrunk. And everything went out. And we were scared. And the guy shot us. And he beat us. He beat us. We had a plan. We went in there with a plan. And I'd go back with the same plan today. The man beat us. Okay. That's it. Now, what about... The was to kill him. What, not to what, capture him. What about their perception? Will you not agree or, or you fellows... I don't think that you have a cross-section here of the black community. I think all of these people here are the people that are set up here to come in for Larry Davis. We worked in, we worked in the black community for years. And, and there's a lot of good... There's a lot of good people there, and they back us 100%. So you're saying... Right. You're... Hold on, I'm going to take a break right now. When we come back, let's restore some control to this and set up some ground rules so that you can hear what's going on and somebody doesn't end up with a chair on their face like some TV shows. We'll be right back. But there won't be any terrorism on this show. I grew up in Queens. I grew up on the streets. I can loud yell just as loud as somebody else. But we will have some degree of order here, okay? Richard, may I address Sir, myself to this gentleman here? If you will, very briefly, and then I'm going to get to... Uh, I'd just like to mention, you say we went there to kill him. We, before Larry Davis, we've been apprehending killers, multiple killers, bigger killers than Larry Davis himself. Since that has happened, we've taken people into killers into custody, multiple killers, without having to fire a shot either. We never had any intention Why do you keep to hurt that anybody. Why system exonerated him? He says Why he was not, he's not convicted of killing. He went to trial. Well, listen, that's, that's very true. He still has two trials pending. As far as I'm concerned, the verdict did not change the circumstances and the facts of these cases. But sir. the verdict is that he's an innocent man in terms of... According to the drug, verdict. Not according, according to the, to the verdict. facts. But that's our legal system. That's true. And very you true. are out there with a shield and a gun to uphold that's that legal true. system. That's very so let's true. get he that straight as well. According to sir. the verdict. First of all, Sergeant Edward Coulter, who is suing the city because of the way McCarran went into that apartment, on a police training film, he said it was nothing but a routine, typical hit. Is that true or false? He never said he that. that. We got the, the, the we have oh. the training film. Who said that? You do not Sergeant have Edward that. Coulter. Said that. Sergeant Edward Coulter, who gave a, a presentation at the police department. There is a tele, there is a videotape. Okay. Where he said that I, it was a routine, know, uh, typical... You sure yes. you uh, you can a routine sergeant Coulter is an emergency yeah. service sergeant. He did a training film for emergency service. When he used the word hit, I think some people take the word hit as killing somebody. He meant hitting the apartment to go in and take a perpetrator well, out. I hate to use the word. Let me just ask. Let me just use his... Let me just use his comment as a springboard, though. Aren't some of the officers suing the city for negligence in this arrest? And I'm Where the was the negligence? Officer, excuse me a second. I'm the first officer that went into the apartment. I went into that apartment knowing that Larry Davis was wanted for at least five homicides. I went into that apartment knowing that the last time the police had confronted Larry Davis, uh, about two or three weeks before that, uh, some uniformed police officers, that he had fired shots at them. I went into that apartment to arrest Larry Davis. All right? I moved into that apartment as fast as I could, all right, under the circumstances, before he could set up and get the drawer on us. Now, I think that by me moving in the apartment the way I did helped probably save our lives. Because if we, if we took our time to get in that apartment, he would have been in the right. back bedroom, we would have walked into that back bedroom, and he would have shot us with the Uzi that he had, with the shotgun, with the forty five. You found an Uzi in the apartment it as well? It was a twenty two. Um, it was an automatic weapon. An automatic weapon. Okay, yes. let me ask you... I'm not sure on an Uzi, but 
was we had right. information but, but, but he had let me ask issue. you this because we sidestepped this issue some police office though, officers though believe there was negligence on the part of the city they are suing right where where's where the negligence i don't think there's any negligence i think it's it's, it's it's a part of today's Thing where people, they may people be suing, but slip I on the sidewalk and they're suing. The Everyone's city. suing today. Okay, let me get to some questions from this side of the audience for a change. Who has a question out here? Yes, sir. I feel that uh, the police officers deserve a lot from us, 100%. And uh, this guy, uh, Davis, and I think, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. He deserved to be where he is forever. <laughs> I, I also give the police officers all the credit in the world. I'm married to one, and I know what they go through every day. I give you a lot of credit for not shooting them and killing them, but I give you all the credit. Let me, let me ask you this. If you're still on the force, after you see what happened in this particular case, does it change the way you react next time when you go in? Could it possibly have a, a, an effect on some officers? I don't, I don't think so. I think we reacted the way we were trained, the way we, we felt we had to react, and that's the same, same way we'll react again. If we see inno innocent people in the way, we're going to react the same way we, we did at this case. We're going to hold our fire. Richard, we've, uh, like I said before, we've apprehended uh, multiple killers since, and uh, basically we use the same tactics. Sometimes the element of the surprise, sometimes if uh, it's a hostage situation, you have to wait till they come out. Father Lucas has been a guest on this show and uh, uh, certainly uh, someone who has made headlines himself. What is your reaction to what happened in this case? Well, several things, I think. Uh, Officer McCarran talked about uh, the good people versus us. Well, I don't know what his definition of a good person. The law-abiding people. Yeah, that's right. And I've spent more times in the Roman Catholic priesthood than he has in the police department. And that makes me unlaw-abiding because I don't see things his way. That's his problem. Talk about non-law-abiding. These are the people who uphold the system as long as the system reach a decision that they disagree with. We had a PBA head talking that he's not going to take that laying down. He's going to take revenge. Secondly, when you live in the community that I was born and raised in, and you see the way the police operate, you're very skeptical about them saying that they held a fire because of children involved. They did not hold their fire with Eleanor Bumpers. They did not hold their fire with Michael Stewart, with Nicholas Bartlett, and on and on with Clifford Glover, and on and on and on. So we'd be very surprised to hear them saying they held their fire because of children involved. But isn't this a different... We, 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 you bring up Eleanor Bumpers and you bring up other cases... As an illustration not, but, of the way they normally operate but, in our community. But the difference with Larry Davis is that he has three illegal weapons in the house. He's a drug dealer. He is uh, a person who has been known for violent yes. behavior, you know, if not there, convicted of it. There's an old saying, the police have been known for more violent behavior. There's an old saying, qui facet per alium facet per se. He was a drug dealer dealing and selling for them. That's not Secondly, true. Absolutely when you not talk, true, that has not been right, proven. The right of, any more than to call him a killer, of I which know. he was exonerated But Father in court. Lucas, if I the might... The right of self-defense... Okay extend to every human being by virtue of being a human being. But and nowhere in my theology or scripture do I learn that you're unable to defend yourself if those coming to murder you have on a uniform and carry a badge. Right now, though, right. right now, though, you are guilty of what you're saying. You're saying the system says that he's innocent and they're not, they're not uh, uh, really giving the credence to the system. Nobody has... And they're sworn to nobody, that Nobody system. has brought forth any evidence that Larry Davis, any concrete evidence or any conviction or anything that could be tracked to a conspiracy between Larry Davis dealing drugs for the police department. That has not been proven and yet, happened, Richard, and yet you stated happened. as fact. Wait a minute. And you, it, you have it to never understand will bring any such evidence. Larry Davis went through a trial of, called a murder trial, which he was exonerated. Did it not strike you funny that somebody who was shot six police officers, the first trial they had were murder for, quote, minority people, when this society don't care less what That's happens to minority true. people, it's whether it's society. done by black folks or whether society. it's done by white folks. The original trial for true. which he was exonerated was in order to prevent this trial from taking place because they figured he would be torn to return away in jail for a long time. It didn't work out that way. An intelligent jury of his peers exonerated him from those murder trials. Excuse me, Richard. Okay. Richard, may I say something? May I say Detective something? McCarran. During the trial, I noticed Father Lucas attending the trial. And I just wonder, in the parish that Father Lucas is in, and I believe in Harlem somewhere, that Resurrection Church, I'm sure that there must be some people, parishioners in that parish, that would need Father Lucas's help a lot more than Larry Davis may need it. 
Okay, yeah. all right. Some poor law, law well, I, I think I gave citizen. quite a bit of time. But you know something? I don't think from quotes, Father Lucas, excuse me one moment. I think I gave you quite a bit of time trying to help this morning. You to, trying we to help might you to return show you later priority. on in the show after this phone call. Good morning. You're on the air. Speak out. Do. Hi, Richard. I'm a city correctional officer. Yes? I'm in favor of the police officers. I had dealings with Larry Davis when he was first arrested. He made allegations that the Department of Corrections was beating him up, that he had broken hands, he walked around with crutches. Well, that yesterday, the, let me interrupt you for a moment. Yesterday when I came to interview him uh, at the correctional facility, he walked in on a crutch and said that uh, he had suffered injuries while he was incarcerated. Yeah, he, he did this several times. It was all investigated. He said his hands were getting closed and gates. It was never true. It was everybody in blue against Larry Davis? This I, can't be true. He was moved to a Manhattan Correctional Center, for not for his protection, but to, for the protection of the Department of Corrections because we were the ones under his scrutiny we were the ones who were getting right. blamed for beating him up. Right. Every let, time he was moved, he let was me videotaped, let, and it was never true. Let me interrupt you for just one moment, because this leads us to something else, and, and it's something that we've seen quite a bit of recently, and that's manipulation of the media and media image. Um, and we've seen the media accused of being too easily led in the Tawana Brawley case after a grand jury found that there was no evidence of a, of a crime committed. We've seen the Reverend Al Sharpton involved in particular cases in the past that uh, have garnered a lot of media attention. In fact, I'm surprised that he hasn't been involved in the Larry Davis case uh, as of yet. He's what? He's trying hard to get him in. I'm trying to get him in. I'm. You may be recognizing Ma him in this matter. You won't tell me what this show is about, frankly. Okay. Well, if you want to have it about Al Sharpton, have it about Al Sharpton. It's a good thing. I gave you a chance to speak. But I will say a few things, too. Here is the village voice of this week. And this is only one picture. But uh, I was very surprised because most of the pictures I'd seen in the media, and th this, is, this can probably work on, work on both the left and the right side of the press, I got the impression that Larry Davis was going to be this hulking, large giant of a man. Look at this picture, if you can, right here. Doesn't... That looks like a, a fairly formidable figure, you know, shot... Larry Davis is about five foot five, five foot six, five three. You say? All right. Big of heart. Big of heart. You say? Here in the in the Village Voice, the uh, writer describes him this way: shackled along the wrists, waists, and ankles, a postmodern Kunta Kinte. Larry Davis is a star. He's a muscular young black man who blasted his way out of a small apartment sieged by a 27-member team of armed police officers, wounding six of them in the process. It was the night he became an urban legend. A black Billy the Kid, an adolescent gunslinger, outshoots an army of cops and lives to tell about it. He compares Larry Davis to Prince. We've seen people call, uh, Lynn Stewart call him a black Rambo, not a black Sambo. The media, the creation of a legend or a hero through the perception of the media is something I want to talk about in the next segment of People Are Talking. But before we do that, I asked Larry Davis about this media perception and about the sort of stardom of somebody who has been in a courtroom accused of committing crimes. This is what he had to say. Would you like to be a star? Well, somebody like to be somebody. <laughs> like they say, you want to, oh, somebody always want to be rich in life one time, you know. And I, I felt I had a lump there when I took off with the money and drugs. I wanted to be rich one time, but it almost cost me my life. Larry Davis told me during the course of the interview that he has a book and a movie deal in the works. And I asked him, who should play Larry Davis? And he said, well, we're trying to talk right now with Eddie Murphy. <laughs> we're going to come back in just a moment and talk about the media and its presentation of the facts and possible distortion of the facts and figures in some cases that we've seen in our area. Stay with us. <laughs> Coming up on... What have been your perceptions of the media coverage of this case? Has the, has the media turned Larry Davis in so, into sort of a, a counterculture sort of hero? Uh, I think the media has been fair in this case. I think they reported the case. Uh, I see um, last week, uh, Monday or Tuesday after the verdict came in, uh, every television radio station was at the Manhattan Correctional uh, Facility to interview Larry Davis. And I was wondering, was he in a prison or in a hotel? Why do because you say that? 
How do you have access to Larry Davis that you can wheel in TV cameras, recorders? I've gone to prisons before to interview prisoners. It takes you about four hours to get in to speak to them. When you get in there, they tell you there's a head count, wait, this. You don't have the access that you have. One other thing that came up in this case that is really very important and, and, and important for the other police officers to know, we didn't fire first in this case. And that became, somehow, that became an issue. But it right. didn't matter, just as very important, it didn't matter if we fired first or not. When our life is in danger, right, we are supposed to fire first. There's and we should, and we should fire first. Fire. Yes, ma'am, stand up, please. Came here today. I was only paying attention to one side of the story, and that was Larry Davis' story. But after being here today and seeing the clip and listening to the officers, now I understand who is telling the truth. He changed his story so many times on the clip. Come on now. Very true. Thank Thank you. You. Richard, uh, unfortunately, I, unfortunately, it's the only side of the story has been heard. It's, it's, so the media. But that's hasn't... because you guys didn't talk out until now. Well, we had cases pending. What? There... What's that? Yes. Being a police officer, we're not allowed to talk to the press. We have a patrol guy. What about guy. PBA? What about FOP? Well, it's what about, tough. Oh, you got to get through to them, but that's it. Talk. I'd love to give statements. If you do, you could get in trouble for it. You have to go through your superiors. And by the time it comes back to you, you can't do it. Yes. I'm Tom Scotto. I'm president of the Detectives Endowment Association. And while all this media coverage was being given to Larry Davis, I called a press conference in the DEA office to counteract the fabricated story of Larry Davis and his uh, attorney, William Kunstler. You didn't get too much coverage, No, the only one that appeared was Pablo Guzman. I did a half-hour interview with Pablo Guzman, and all that was re uh, uh, previewed on his show was approximately about 10 to 15 seconds of what I said. Therefore, the media was not concerned with what the police department had to say to counteract Larry Davis's statements. They were more concerned about this story regarding police corruption than they were about the facts. I think all the right. media, as a matter of fact, all the media personnel that I have spoke to have indicated to me that they disbelieve everything that Larry Davis says. However, it's a media story, it makes news, and they, they prefer to uh, broadcast okay. what he has to say. As a if, if we had an independent, <laughs> if we had an independent investigation, would you, I, I, and you're the only officer here that Larry Davis, I believe, named to me yesterday as part of this conspiracy. Would you give up immunity? I think I said that right at the top of the show yeah. here. I would give up all my legal rights. I'll speak to any special prosecutor, district attorney, anyone that they would want me to speak to, I will speak to regarding this case. Let them come forward, let them show their case, and <clears throat> I don't think it'll last too long. I'm, I'm be delighted to. Okay. We're, so gonna, back. we're gonna take a break right now. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back to People Are Talking. All right, certainly most people would agree that there are, there are good cops and bad cops. There are good people and bad people. And I think that hopefully this case will not further aggravate the tensions between communities in the city and the police department. But we all have to remember that in theory and in practice, these men put their lives on the line and walk out there... <laughs> For who? For who? For who? Everybody. For all of us. For everybody. If I may. For all of us. And if they don't, then we work towards a system where they do. If you feel that they don't, we're not talking about 400 years now. We're talking about 1988 and walking on the streets of New York right now. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me today on People Are Talking. Thank you very much. And we'll be right back. Stay with us. Coming up next on Channel 9 News, thousands of firefighters gather on Long Island to say goodbye to a fallen friend. We'll have a late report. Two huge explosions ripped through a Kansas City quarry, leaving death and destruction in its wake. Our I-Team uncovers hidden dangers in our backyard. We'll tell you about toxic PCBs. Plus, a new Democratic leader in the Senate. The latest on the New York City school scandal and what's being done in Albany about it. And how to keep mother and child healthy when you're breastfeeding. That's all coming up at noon. Join us.
brought us together, he reached out. He had the courage to defy his advisors and inquire about Dr. King's jailing in Auburn, Georgia. We won by the margin of our hope, inspired by courageous leadership. In 1964, Lyndon Johnson brought both wings together. The thesis, the antithesis, and the creative synthesis, and together we won. In 1976, Jimmy Carter unified us again, and we won. When we do not come together, we never win. In 1968, the vision and despair in July led to our defeat in November. In 1980, rancor in the spring and the summer led to Reagan in the fall. When we divide, we cannot win. We must find common ground as a basis for survival and development and change and growth. when we debated, differed, deliberated, agreed to agree, agreed to disagree, when we had the good judgment to argue a case and then not self-destruct, George Bush was just a little further away from the White House and a little closer to private life. Tonight, I salute Governor Michael Dukakis.